The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication, podcast publishing made easy, Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome to the Old Time Radio Network Detective Stories, continuing America's love affair with private eyes. We now go back to the early days of radio and our imaginations with our feature presentation. Now for this week's episode of Bulldog Drummond. Broadcasting System brings you another exciting detective adventure with Bulldog Drummond, starring Ned Weaver. Champion of justice, amateur detective, celebrated soldier of fortune of screen and radio, Bulldog Drummond comes to you every week at this same time with more of his baffling and intriguing mysteries. For adventure and excitement, keep this rendezvous with Bulldog Drummond every week. To tell us of his latest adventure, here is Bulldog Drummond. When you're in my type of business, you must reconcile yourself to one thing, unpopularity. The people on the other side of the fence avoid you like the plague. For example, last Friday, Denny and I dropped into Larry's for a late evening snack. Larry's is one of those intimate little spots on West 47th Street with the usual assortment of cartoon caricatures on the walls and the usual assortment of shady characters at the tables. The place was crowded, but the cheering section was conspicuously silent as Denny and I squeezed our way toward a booth in the rear. Uh, oh, look, sir, that, that booth isn't vacant after all. Someone's sitting there. So I see. Roxy Hagen. Hagen? Friend of yours, Captain Drummond? Not exactly a friend, Denny. A professional acquaintance, you might say. Roxy and I both deal in crime, but from opposite approaches. You can easily size up our relationship by the unwelcome glance he's giving me. Uh, but look, sir, he's leaving the booth. Well, come on, let's get it before someone else does. I... Well, this is a bit of luck, and I'm famished. And I wonder why Roxy left so hurriedly. Well, obviously he was finished. No, on the contrary. Look here, his glass. He hasn't touched his drink. Oh. You know, Denny, I think I frightened Roxy off. Well, that's one way of getting a seat in a crowded restaurant, eh, sir? Oh, here's a menu. I see you didn't touch your drink. What's that? I said I see you didn't touch your drink. Now, what business is that of yours? And if you must know, that drink... Who's he? Oh, Denny? He was supposed to be alone. He's usually with me. Well, if you say he's all right, he's all right. Move over, you. Uh, now, look here. I, I... I said over. Uh, but I, I... Over, Denny. Yes, sir. Ah, let's get down to business. A good idea. I got it with me. Uh, you see, Denny? He's got it with him. Oh, he has? Oh, that's fine. I... Hey, what am I talking about? Uh, what's the matter with him? He's the confused type. Well, tell him to shut up. Well, of all the... Uh... Shut up, Denny. Yes, sir. Now, here's your ticket. You hold it until I tell you where and when to deliver. Is that clear? Quite clear. All right. Now, your telephone number. Elwood 8 Elwood 8 Here's the envelope. Al said that was the deal. If Al said that's what it was, that's what it is. Now wait for my call. I'll be waiting. You'll be hearing from me. Well, sir, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Denny, I wish I knew. Huh? You don't know the man? Never saw him before in my life. But he gave you that ticket. Yes, I'm afraid it's a case of mistaken identity. Oh? What kind of a ticket is it? Obviously, it's a parcel claim check of some sort. And he wants to ensure it's safekeeping. 
Well, what are we going to do about it? We're going home and wait for our mysterious visitor's call. Oh, but how do you know he'll call? Oh, there's no doubt about that. He'll call, all right. Uh, what makes you so sure? Because, Denny, he's made a sizable investment in us. In us? Hmm. Look for yourself in this envelope. There's a thousand dollar bill. You know, sir, it, it just occurred to me. What, Denny? Roxy Hagen. You said yourself we frightened him off at Larry's tonight. That claim check and the thousand dollar bill were meant for him. Undoubtedly. Well, then why not look up Roxy and get to the bottom of this? Because, Denny, I have an idea that Roxy will look us up in short order. We'll just sit and wait for development. In this instance, we'll let the case come to us. Don't forget, we're holding the trump card. And uh, it looks as if someone is about to make a bid. Hello? Hello, Elwood 89970. Yes? Uh, I'm calling about Steve. Steve? Yes, Steve Mantell, the man you met at Larry's. Oh, yes. Well, this is very important. He wants me to bring you to him. And who are you? Oh, I'm Rita Miller. I'm Steve's fiancée. Very well, Miss Miller. Where shall we meet? Well, you'd better come here to my apartment. It's 33 Grove Place, 3A. I'm afraid to leave this building. Why? What's the matter? A man has been following me since I left Steve. And for the past hour, he's been watching my apartment from the street. <laughs> Now, Miss Miller, about this man who's been following you. He's still down there. Look for yourself. Denny, the window. Uh, yes, sir. Miss Miller, suppose you enlighten me about the parcel claim check. Claim check? What claim check? The one I'm holding for Steve Mantell. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Captain Drummond. Yes, Denny? There is a man standing across the street. I told you, he's the one. There's nothing unusual about a man standing on a street corner, is there, sir? Uh, not necessarily. He's wearing a tan hat and a brown coat. Huh? And he's carrying a black bag. Well, Denny? Oh, uh, that's correct, sir. He's holding a black bag all right. Well, now do you believe me? Who is he? I don't know. Oh, please, Captain Drummond. Steve asked me to bring you to him as soon as possible, and he said to make sure that I'm not followed. But how will I get out of here? Well, now, let's see. Uh, Denny. Uh, yes, sir? Stand next to Miss Miller a moment, will you? Mm-hmm. That should do it. Uh, do what? Go in the other room, Denny. The other room? Why, sir? To undress. What? Miss Miller is leaving this building with me, disguised as you. Yeah, oh, but, sir... Now, I... do as I tell you, Denny. Oh, very well, but... Uh, really, sir, the things I go through for you... <laughs> Poor Denny. Well, anyway, Miss Miller, it worked. We're not being followed. Thank heaven. Now I can take this derby off. Better leave it on, just in case. Oh. Which way? It's Elm Street, 347. It's only a few blocks from here. Miss Miller, what sort of business is your fiancé in? He's, he's a laboratory technician. Where? Well, he just came in from Chicago the day before yesterday. He finished an assignment there. I see, Chicago. Uh-huh. After we're married, we expect to go back to Chicago. As soon as Steve completes some work here... What kind of work? Well, I don't know, really. Steve just said it was very important to him. And profitable? What do you mean by that? Nothing. Captain Drummond, you've got to tell me what it's all about. Frankly, Miss Miller, I'm as much in the dark as you are. But I'm sure Steve Mantell can enlighten the both of us. What number did you say? 347. It's that brownstone. Next to the apartment house there. Yes, this is it. There. All right. Just down these stairs. He has the basement apartment. Here we are. Gee, that's strange. What is? The lights are out. He said he'd be waiting. He wouldn't have gone to bed. I'll ring again. Steve! Steve! Captain Robin, maybe something's happened to him. Yeah. Steve, I just... Yeah, what is it? Captain Robin, this isn't Steve. Hey, what are you two want? We're looking for Steve Mantell. You got the wrong place. You don't live here. This is Steve's apartment. What do you do, thank you, Don? You getting me out of bed in the middle of the night to play games? Steve lives here. I saw him here only a few hours ago. Is that damn crazy? Believe me, Captain Drummond, that's the truth. Look at the get-up one here. 
Don't you know, girlie, you can get picked up for imitating a man? Now, just a moment. Now, listen, you two. You ring that bell again and I call the cops. Now, go on, beat it. Oh, I... Well, Miss Miller? Oh, Captain Drummond, this is a trick of some kind. Steve was here a few hours ago. This is his place. Believe me, it is. I... I know, the mailbox. That's it. The mailbox over there. Steve's name is on it. Look, you can... Evidently, there must be some mistake, Miss Miller. The name on this card is James Burton. Now, try to get some rest, Miss Miller. But where can Steve be? That's what we're going to try to find out. Denny? Yes, I'm ready, sir. All right, let's get started. I'll call you, Miss Miller, just as soon as I have a lead. Come on, Denny. What about the man with the black bag who was keeping a watch in this building? Oh, he left a few moments after you departed with Miss Miller. Uh, by the way, sir, where are you going to stop to look for Steve Mantell? At 347 Elm Street. But you said it looked as if Mantell didn't live there. It only looked that way, did he? Uh, oh, what do you mean? The man in pajamas who answered the door. Uh, what about him? He said we awakened him. I looked him over quite carefully. And? Well, it isn't customary, Denny, for a man who wears pajamas to sleep with socks and shoes on. No answer, sir. Shall I try it again? No, we'll use the skeleton key. Uh, but uh, what if he's inside? We'll take that chance. Ah, oh, there it is. See if you can find the light switch. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, I have it, sir. Well. My word, what a mess. Looks as if a cyclone hit the place. See what's in the next room, Denny. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, Denny. Yes? Never mind that next room. Oh, 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 did you find something? Yes, what we came for. Behind this couch. There he is, Steve Mantell. Dead? Yes, Denny. Very dead. Our story continues in just a moment. Political quacks and adventurers belonging to the lunatic fringe of American life seek to gain adherence and make easy money for themselves by diverting citizens from their real problems and attacking some racial or religious group as being at the bottom of the shortages, the strikes, or the rising prices. People who, out of indifference to American principles of racial and religious freedom and undecided about prejudice, or who might support hate campaigns against Protestants or Jews, Catholics or Negroes, are potential confederates or dupes of such subversive forces. Don't be fooled. Don't be misled. Be a real American. And now, back to our Bulldog Drummond adventure. Oh, I've searched everywhere, sir. Found nothing. Uh, anything in his pockets? Empty, every one of them. Whoever killed Steve Mantell certainly went over this apartment with a fine tooth comb. But they overlooked one thing, Denny. Yes, what's that? This label on the inside of his coat pocket. Here, look. Hmm. Bomb Brothers, Clothes, Chicago, Illinois. November 16th, 1946. And the name of the wearer here. Edward Torrey. Edward Torrey? But his name is Steve Mantell. Evidently not in Chicago. Well, what do you mean, sir? I mean that Steve Mantell found it convenient to use two names. Well, come on, there's nothing more we can do here. First, we're stopping off the nearest telegraph office to send a wire to Chicago. Uh, to whom in Chicago? The police. I have an idea they'll be able to supply me with an account of the activities of one Edward Torrey, alias Steve Mantell. And then, Denny, from the telegraph office, we're going straight home. But why home? Oh, just to see which way the wind's been blowing there. Good heavens, sir. Look at our place. As you said about Steve Mantell's apartment, it looks as if a cyclone had hit it. Probably the same one. Oh. Oh, so that's what you meant about coming home to see which way the wind was blowing. That's what I meant. Then you expected to find our apartment this way. I did, Denny. Uh, someone had an idea that the claim check would be here. Foxy hmm. Hagen. 
He's the one, sir. He knew Mantell gave you the ticket. You yourself said he would look us up. He was here, and he killed Mantell. I don't doubt that Roxy was here, Denny, but it's for Mantell's murderer. I'd elect the man in the pajamas is the most likely suspect. Uh, just the same, sir. I think it's about time we had Roxy taken in by the police. Not at all. Roxy will be of much more value to us on the loose, at least for the time being. At present, my main concern is the claim check. Whatever parcel it's redeemable for must certainly be of great value. It certainly must. Mantell gave us a thousand-dollar bill to guarantee the check's safekeeping. He saved the check, but not himself. There's no mistake he was murdered because of it. Yes, and our place here turned topsy-turvy in the search for it. Well, anyway, there's comfort in knowing that you have it with you. Now we can find out what makes it so valuable. I haven't it with me, Denny. What? You left it here? No, I mailed it. You mailed it? While you were waiting outside the telegraph office. It will arrive here safe and sound in the first mail tomorrow morning. No, I... I can't believe it. Steve isn't dead. Yes, Miss Bella, Steve Mantell was murdered. Oh, why? Steve never did anything wrong to anybody. Why would anybody want to kill him? Miss Bella, I have an idea that Steve Mantell wasn't everything you thought he was. What do you mean by that? I'm not sure, but I should know by morning. What are you talking about? I expect a wire from the Chicago police in answer to an inquiry of mine concerning Steve Mantell. And, in addition, an important envelope will arrive by the first mail. No, Captain Drummond, you're wrong. I know you're wrong. Steve wouldn't... Captain Drummond. Yes, Denny? The man with the black bag. I just saw him from the window. Got out of an auto downstairs. He's standing on the corner again. All right. Miss Miller. Yes? I want you to remain here in your apartment. I'll call you in the morning. Come along, Denny. It's about time we had a talk with that man with a black bag. Yes, there he is, sir. Standing near the street lamp. Stay in the shadows along the building. Have your revolver ready. It's ready right now, sir. Look, he's walking away. Sir, he must have seen us coming. Hurry. But he's walking faster. He's making for his car. Quickly, before... Down, Denny. Call over behind those stairs. Man with a bag. Look at him, Denny. Why, he's falling over. Come on. Come on. Those shots were meant for him, not us. Well, sir? He's dead. Get that black bag. It's over near the curb there. You're right. Yes, here it is, sir. Look at this. His identification card. Hmm. Robert Matthews. Benson Investigation Bureau, Chicago, Illinois. A private detective. Now, let me see the bag. Yes, here you are, sir. Hmm. An odd-looking box, those dials. It looks like some sort of a radio, a short wave set of some kind. It picks up waves, Denny, but not sound waves. Yes, but what kind is it? A Geiger counter. It's used to detect and measure the presence of radioactivity in the atmosphere. Oh, oh yes, I remember now. The atomic bomb. I remember seeing it in the newsreels. It was used in the atomic bomb test. That's right. Oh, sir, the, the atomic bomb... The parcel chain check must be for the package that contains an atomic bomb. Denny. Heaven, sir. Well, here we are. Easy, uh, Denny. Denny. I'm sure an atomic bomb isn't involved in this. You can rest assured the city's peace will be undisturbed. As for us, we'll just have to wait for the claim check in the mail. In the meantime, let's hope nothing blows up in our faces. Mornings for the mail to be late. This above all days. Don't worry, Denny. It'll be along any minute. Yes, hello. Captain Hugh Drummond. Uh, who's calling? This is Western Union. A telegram from Chicago for Captain Drummond. Oh, oh just a moment. Uh, Captain Drummond, the wire from Chicago is here. Oh, give me the phone. Captain Drummond speaking. A wire from police headquarters, Chicago. Yes, go ahead, read it. Regarding your inquiry concerning Edward Torrey... Subject is wanted for questioning in connection with theft of $100,000 worth of radium from Chicago office of Crystal Laboratories. Case in addition to police in hands of Benson Investigation Bureau. Signed, Inspector C.F. Bradley. Thank you very much. Well, Denny, you can rest easier. It's definitely not an atomic bomb. Radium. Radium? A hundred thousand dollars worth, to be exact. Stolen from a laboratory in Chicago. The pieces begin to fit together. Robert Matthews of the Benson Investigation Bureau was trying to track down that stolen radium. That's why he was killed. 
Mantell stole the radium? Mantell, under the name of Edward Torrey. But, sir, why was Matthews carrying the Geiger counter? Well, Denny, radium, too, sends off radioactive elements. Uh, oh, oh, that must be the mail. That lot. I'll get it. I... Yes? Hello, Drummond. Well, the gentleman of the pajamas. I hardly recognized you without your nocturnal get-up. Yes. Yeah. But you recognize this, don't you? Offhand, I'd say that's a revolver. You win the $64. Uh, Captain Drummond, did the envelope come out? Oh, dear. All right. Back up, both of you. We have a visitor, Denny. Not for long. Oh, by the way, Drummond, uh, the mailman won't be here this morning. Your mail was picked up for you. Don't you know it's impolite to read other people's mail? Funny man. It's also illegal. You too, huh? Turn around, funny men. I said around. This ain't a dime store toy. Turn around. Face that wall, that's it. Both you funny men cracked your last joke. Oh! Captain Drummond. Yes, Denny. Uh, you all right? So far. Oh. Denny. Denny, look behind us. Oh. Why, it's he. Yes. And as dead as he would have had us. Uh, but uh, 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 where did the shot come from? There's no time to investigate now. Get the Geiger counter, counter and hurry. Uh, yes, sir. We're going radium hunting. But where are we going to look? We don't have the claim check. I remember the number. It was 862. Oh, but what good's the number? We don't even know where the parcel is stored. Denny, if you came from Chicago by train and you wanted to check a parcel immediately upon arrival, where would you do it? Why, well, 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 at Grand Central Station, of course. That's where we begin. Grand Central Station. <laughs> Enter the station from the West Plaza, Denny. That's nearest the parcel checking room. Yes, sir. Oh, what's that? The Geiger counter. Listen to it. Oh, it's ticking fast, sir. The nearer we get to the station, the more active it becomes. The radium must be in the parcel room. Parcel 862, you say? That's right, 862. I want to see it immediately. Sorry, 862 was checked out just a few minutes ago. Get going, Denny. The package was picked up just before I got there. Yeah, right, sir. Uh, you know, sir, I thought something was strange. Just as you went into the station, the counter trailed off and then stopped completely. Cut across town, Denny. We'll avoid the heavy traffic. Yes, where are we going? We're paying a long delayed call on Roxy Hagen. But why Roxy now? Because the parcel room attendant's description of the man who picked up the package fits Roxy to a T. <laughs> Uh, the counter's starting up. We're on the right trail again. Yes. And we're getting nearer to Roxy's place. Oh, this elevator is so slow we could have walked up faster. We'll be there in a second. <laughs> Start it as if it came from above. This way, Denny. Right. Here, here it is. And the door's locked. Come on, we're breaking it in. Ready? I'm ready. It's coming. Oh, what's wrong? That's it. Oh, but look, sir, the window's open. He must have gone down the fire. No, no. No, Denny. Look. Over there on the floor. Oh. It's Roxy. Yes. And it looks as if we won't have that talk with him after all. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll have the exciting climax of tonight's adventure. USO represents the three great faiths, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, and combines the efforts of six member agencies, Young Men's Christian Associations, the National Catholic Community Service, the Salvation Army, Young Women's Christian Associations, the National Jewish Welfare Board, the National Travelers' Aid Association. USO is the voluntary expression of the American people's desire to stand beside the G.I., as shown by the remarkable record of a billion and a half services by a million and a half volunteers. USO's task in 1947 is part of the unfinished task of winning the war, of safeguarding the fruits of victory so that peace can be made secure. They still need USO, 
And USO is you. And now, back to the exciting climax of our story. Why, uh, Captain Drummond. Miss Villa? Come in. Go ahead, Denny. We were going to call on you sooner, but we were busy clearing up the case. You mean you found out who killed Steve? Well, let's say we found out who was responsible for his death. But you, Miss Miller, can undoubtedly tell us who the actual murderer was. I? What are you talking about? Was it Roxy? Roxy? Or was it the gentleman of the pajamas? What are you... Or did you do that one yourself, too? Captain Drummond, I demand to know what you mean. Rather a good actress, too, in addition to her other talents, huh, Denny? Oh, I don't know, sir. I would say her performance is a bit too studied, deliberate. I don't know what you two are driving at, or what ideas you have, but I'm sure that the police will settle this. You know, Miss Miller, I thought the same thing. That's why I took the liberty of calling them. They should arrive shortly. But in the meantime, you might turn the radium over to us. Radium? Yes, I'd feel much better if it were in our hands. Radium? Then, Abe, you might demonstrate our little gadget. It was pleasure, sir. Now, Miss Miller, here's the little item that no household should be without, especially if the radium thief should be lurking about. All right, Denny, switch it on. Interesting item, isn't it, Miss Miller? No. That's enough, Denny. Well, what have you proven, Captain Drummond? Oh, now, really, Miss Miller, for a person with such a keen interest in radium, I'm surprised at your ignorance concerning our little telltale mechanism. By elimination, it led us directly here to the radium and to you. And um, speaking of elimination, you appear to excel at it, too. Yes? Yes. Please stop me if I'm incorrect. You had a neat plan worked out. You put a scare into your fiancé to get the claim check out of his hand. Steve Mantell was murdered. You led to his apartment on a ruse while you had Roxy go through my place for the claim check. When I dropped the hint to you that I was expecting an important envelope in the mail, you realized it was really time to get down to business. The man with a black bag was getting too close for comfort. So you had him written off. And then I imagine you played off Roxy and your other cohort against each other. But even a two-way split between you and Roxy was unsatisfactory. So Roxy had to go. And that left just you and a hundred thousand dollars worth of radium. Am I wrong? Well, uh, I would take Miss Miller's silence to mean that you're quite correct, sir. Yes, Denny. Miss Miller had a good plan, but it didn't work. And if this Miller thinks her plan was good, wait until she hears the one the state will have laid out for her. And in cases like hers, the state's plans always work. Bulldog Drummond will return in just a moment to tell us about next week's story. Let's hold down traffic deaths and injuries. Death on our highways is increasing. Traffic accidents have been mounting since the end of the war. Smash-ups have reached more than once a minute, all day, every day in the year. But the encouraging thing is that accident prevention education has actually succeeded in holding down accidents below the level of 1941, the last pre-war year. A job can be done. Lives can be saved. <laughs> Now, here is Bulldog Drummond to tell us about next week's story. Next week's story has many curious features. Among them, a lake that climbs a mountain simply because it's bored. And a scheme devised by a blonde Miss Baker, which would have failed if it had succeeded. And only succeeded when finally it failed. Miss Baker had to be destroyed, of course. But I'm sure she didn't mind. And anyhow, as Denny puts it, what else could she have expected when she had... No murder to guide her. Be sure to listen, won't you? And so, into the night walks Bulldog Drummond, seeking new adventure and excitement. Join us next week at the same time when we'll bring you Bulldog Drummond, starring Ned Weaver, in another thrilling story. Tonight's adventure was written by Edward J. Adamson. 
Arthur Van Horn speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>